That's really good. Amen? Oh, come all ye faithful. Give all the musicians and the singers a round of applause, please. And give God the praise, of course. He deserves it. Thank you. Thank you, holy God, for uh, every week is a beautiful week of music and uh, uh, even more so around this time of the year we seem to be a little bit uh, just in an extra better way. Is extra better okay? Is that all right? Mm -hmm. That uh, we just are better about opening up our ears to maybe the words and what something uh, in the message is coming out that you would hear that and that message was be, would be, of course, for you, but of course for the Lord. Go to Acts chapter number 2. Uh, that was a hint by that first slide up there. We are going to look at uh, a continuation of what we uh, started a few weeks ago, the Acts 2 project, and we're going to take our, our message out of uh, our text in Acts chapter number 2 as we did uh, just uh, last week when we looked at uh, Christmas uh, convictions, and, and so let me uh, kind of get myself ordered a little bit here, and, and we'll get cranking. I, I don't think I have a whole lot of stuff going on here, but somehow I, I make it look like I've got, uh, I don't know, a, a 25-page uh, sermon. Well, actually, I do have a 25-page sermon here, so praise the Lord, Acts chapter number 2. We're only going to use four verses this morning, and uh, but I believe that they communicate the message that God would have for us. And if you open up God's word, as uh, old Bobby says all the time, you open it up anywhere, it's all good. So we're thankful for uh, the word of God. And uh, when I think about being able to have a conversation, and we've spoken about conversations in the past, I, I really uh, I enjoy having a good conversation with people. Even Sean Bristow is trying to find his way into the auditorium. There you go. Your wife's up here. There you go. There you go, that boy. You're welcome anytime, brother. But I enjoy my conversations with him. That's the way we can do that. But uh, he likes me having a little bit of fun. He's a ball player. Ball players, well, he's probably never been booed by as many as I have been booed. But, but uh, we've all been booed a little and cheered, uh, maybe unnecessarily. But... When it comes to conversations, they're very, very important. Uh, again, uh, we have spoken on that. Uh, we even looked in uh, Luke's gospel many years ago, and uh, uh, I believe it was Luke's gospel, uh, John's, and uh, looking at, actually John's gospel, and looking at Jesus' last conversations with his disciples. And you want to know how he conversed with his disciples, grab a hold of John 13, 14, 15, 16, and you see him sharing his last words, his last conversations. Well, this morning I want to look at your Christmas conversations. Now, it's a good time of year. We've talked about it different times of the year where, you know, there's different times where it seems like you have a better chance of having a good, spiritual, godly conversation. But it has something to do with last week's message, which is convictions, Christmas convictions because we say okay um, what am I going to talk about and we're always thinking what am I going to talk about what am I going to talk about well I believe it's more important to know why you're going to have the conversation and the why goes back to your convictions so why do you believe what you believe and that's what we looked at last week why in the world would I bother to have a conversation unless it was really and truly about my convictions of what I believe who do I believe in? Why do I believe what I believe? One of the biggest parts about our discipleship ministry is that you can learn the Bible in a way where you can say, hey, I can have a conversation with somebody over uh, the, the truth of and the Bible truth of salvation or baptism or eternal security. If you want to know anything about baptism, all you need to do is listen to Sean Summers preach a three-minute message in the baptismal last week on uh, baptism. Thank you, Holy Spirit, and thank you, Sean, for the, the words that were spoken of God through your voice of, hey, this isn't to save me. This is to have me stand up and tell you baptism to me is an act of obedience after salvation, and I stand up and tell you what happened to me. Hallelujah. You did a, well, a wonderful job, and then you see that baptism. But a strong and persuasive, excuse me, a strong persuasion 
or belief, a persuasive belief, a persuasive argument, a, a state of mind in which one is free from doubt. So as I brought the message to an end last week in our time of invitation, but it was a, it was a, um, a statement early on, a question early on, so we introduced the message was now. Why do our, by the way, I fixed that this week. Aren't you proud of me? You know, Dwayne, you got, you know, they, nobody, they didn't miss. You guys didn't see, you didn't notice that the screen wasn't working, right? You guys didn't notice that, right? Why do our convictions about Jesus Christ matter so much? Well, it leads into this today. Because... If your conversations don't have any conviction, then people are going to think that you're just taking up space in the room with idle chatter, which, by the way, many of us have done. Maybe none of you have, but I know I have. Sometimes we just talk to hear ourselves talk, right? Sometimes there's not a lot of conviction in our statements. We just need to get something in there. And then somebody says, well, why did you say that? Well, nobody ever asked me why. And so the conversation breaks down. Well, my prayer, my hope this Christmas is that you have conversations that are meaningful toward Christmas. We all realize that this is a great time of the year. It's a great time to have a spiritual conversation. You couldn't ask for a better time. But then again, you get the spring, you've got Easter, you've got the, the times of the year, summer, fall, spring, the, the, the different seasons, and you, there's any time is a good time. But for now, it's an extra special time to say, hey, what do you believe about Christmas? Do you think that Christmas has gotten a little crazy? Do you think that people really have lost the true meaning of Christmas? It's deeper than that. You see, our Christmas conversations with different people need to take on the who of the conversation. I mean, we look at why, again, for the convictions so that we can point to the who. The who that is the subject matter, the who that is the person that's sitting in the room. What are your Christmas conversations like these days? Have you had any yet? You ought to. It is December 20th. It's five days not left for shopping, but five days left to have a conversation about Christmas before it gets here. Because when the 24 hours of Christmas are gone, people are going to be packing up their trees, taking down their lights... Or some of them leave them up all year long. I don't know if you do that. I'm not, I'm, it's okay. I'm not picking, I'm not. But a conversation is an oral exchange of sentiments, observations, opinions, ideas. Since you're sitting here for a moment, I've had some really, really good conversations with you over the years. And most of my conversations, well, the good ones anyway, with Milt, have been over things of God. They've been over Jesus Christ. They've been over prayer, or they've been over a visit, or they've been over a time where we have just wanted to rejoice in what the Lord is doing in our lives. I had a conversation over email recently with someone who said, I just stopped, I had to email and let you know, but you know what? I just needed to, to chat with you and have a discourse with you over the things that God has done in my life since so-and-so and back then and so-and-so. And, and this person was testifying. We were conversing through email. By the way, you can converse through email. You can if you do it right. I heard there was letters that were used to write the New Testament. They had conversation that way. But I will tell you, the Acts of the Apostles and the Gospels really are our only, only accounts of interactive conversation until you get to that, that incredible book of Revelation. And then you see Jesus Christ telling John the Apostle, hey, write this down. Woohoo! And then you see all those red letters that are in the book of Revelation, and you're going, wow, what a conversation they had up in glory. It was more than a chat, I'm sure. Who will you talk about then? That's my question this morning. That's God's question for you and me. 
You see, have we been having any conversations about the Lord? Yeah, we talked about that a little bit last week, but we're going to go a little further because we're specifically talking about conversations that come from convictions. And if those convictions are not certain, if you don't know why, you don't know what really you believe and why you believe it, then your Christmas conversations will be non-existent. I read in different places as I was just looking up stuff the last couple of days about prayer. It is said that prayer is simply a conversation with God. Some of you have used that, yes, maybe just communication with God, having a conversation with God. But I wonder if that example is really the reason why some of our conversations aren't very good. Because our prayer life seemingly is a one-way conversation. And so maybe the reason why we do not have the Christmas conversations that we need to have about the who is because in our prayer life, our prayer is only about one person, me. I was taught about prayer shortly after I got saved. Being a former Catholic and coming out of that DNA, and by the way, appreciative of the things that I learned, because I learned some Bible truth. I just didn't know the why and the who, but I learned some good things. I learned about prayer, but more of it, of the prayer in my life was a ritual. I learned about the prayers that I made were to guarantee me something in my works. I wonder today if when we have learned about prayer and how it's a conversation with God that we have been misguided because I'm thankful for those that taught me that prayer is not you one way badgering God, bantering God. God does tell you to come to him and to put everything before him. Yes, I agree. That's what the Bible teaches. But after a while, you and I ought to have a conversation with God. I hear from people so often, I pray to God, I pray to God, and I still haven't heard what to do. I just still don't know what to do. Maybe it's because you haven't asked him to get in on the conversation. And that's the basis of our Christmas conversations today. Who are the people that you love to talk to? Who are the people that you'd love to talk to? And maybe there's somebody out there that you'd love to have a talk with today. And maybe in that whole light you'd say, oh, I don't know. What would it be like to have a Christmas conversation? I love to have conversations with certain people. And, and the person I love to have a conversation with more than anybody is my granddaughter, Madeline. So I'm going to give her a call and see if she's available right now and see... Maybe they're in church, hallelujah, if they're in church, then, or maybe they're not in church, they're just, oh, Madeline, is that you? Grandpa's calling you. How you doing? What are you doing? Hey, hey, Madeline, are you breaking? We're saying hi at church. Say hi, everybody. <laughs> Say hi, everybody. <laughs> I just wanted people to know that I love having conversations with you. And yeah, she laughed. I love you. And she gave the phone a hug. That's the best. You see, conversations are important, aren't they? I'm kind of bummed she didn't want to talk to me. But isn't that part of introducing a conversation? See, sometimes the other person's not available. Maybe they don't want to listen. Or maybe the subject matter is too just not right. But again, in this season of life, in this time of life, what a better time than to take your convictions, why you believe what you believe, and open up a Christmas conversation. This is what Peter did in verse number 37. Watch this now in your text. This is off of the greatest first preaching message of the early church. This is the Holy Spirit power within Peter preaching the truth of Jesus Christ. Last week we talked about how this conviction came from the preaching of the word because Peter used David as an example in his conviction of Jesus Christ Messiah. And now they're at a point where it's kind of coming to the invitation. Here's the invitation coming. Here it comes. He's gonna, but, but first a couple little things happen. 
So watch this. Verse number 37, chapter number 2. Now, when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart and said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? Something neat's already going on there. We'll talk about that in a moment. Verse 38. Then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Think. Peter's been preaching. Verse number 36, he says, Therefore let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God hath made that same Jesus whom ye crucified, both Lord and Christ. He has all their attention. Then their hearts are pricked, and then they ask a question. Then Peter answers them in verse 38. I think we've got a conversation going, don't we? We've got a conversation. This is a Christmas conversation. What a great conversation to have. So what does he do when he follows it up? He says in verse number 39, For the promise is unto you and to your children, and to all that are afar off, even as many as our Lord, our God, the Lord our God shall call. He calls. He's not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long suffering to us. Word. He's not willing that any should perish. He is calling everyone to salvation. He's calling. He called the nation of Israel. He said, I want you to be saved. I want you to come. In verse number 40, Peter adds a little bit of an oomph in his conversation. And with many other words did he testify and exhort, saying, Save yourselves from this awful religion that's going to send you to hell, this untoward generation. Save yourself from this generation that is believing that their works and their religion in Judaism will get them remission of sin. It says in verse number 41, as a bonus, then they that gladly received his word were baptized, and the same were added unto them 3,000 souls, as we have looked at. I guess that turned out to be a great visitation, excuse me, a great invitation time. But see, there's a conversation that went on here, isn't there? There is a give and take conversation, and even so much that we realize the apostles were included in on the conversation, and it wasn't just Peter. So how can we reserve, uh, what can we observe from this? How can we draw something from this? Well, look at verse number 37 here, and I want you to think about this. First thing, Christmas conviction, excuse me, Christmas conversations, they can involve people who already have a conviction by the Holy Spirit of God. What do you mean? There are people already that you can have a conversation with right now or in the next few days during Christmas, between Christmas and New Year's and this Christmas season that already are convicted by the Holy Spirit of something that God has done in their lives. Or it might be in your conversation that a topic comes up and they go, wow, you really strongly believe in that. Well, yeah, I have some convictions in my life. There's some things that I'm really convicted about, and one of them is that Jesus Christ is the only way, the only truth, and the only life to come unto the Father, Jesus said it himself. Now, how would you find out if someone has conviction by the Holy Spirit? I don't know. Christian, you ought to know. You see, you're the Holy Spirit carrier. As much as in the temple we go, in the physical temple, you are the spiritual temple. You are the spiritual temple that houses the Holy Ghost, the God of the universe. If you are a believer, he lives inside of you. How do you know that there's any conviction unless you have the Holy Spirit in you? But if you have the Holy Spirit of God in you, then you must know that when someone speaks to you or sitting in the room, there's got to be some type of spirit conviction. That's what Peter knew because he's filled with the Holy Spirit of God. No more and no less than what you have. Do you understand? Oh, that's Peter and he's the greatest and he was full and he got an extra pot and he got an extra go and he had this. He had the Spirit of God in him just like you. The interesting part about the lack of us being aware of conviction is that we have closed off and quenched and grieved the Holy Spirit so he cannot show you the conviction of a lost person in your room. That's dangerous for us because there's people that are around that would love to hear the story of how to get saved. How do I know that? Because it's in the Bible. And Paul was sent all over the place after Peter was sent preaching all over the place. You follow this life of Peter for just a couple of chapters here. Peter and John go in and out of the uh, 
the jail. They got in and out of being held. They got the Jewish people going after him. They got the Roman people going after him. It don't matter. God keeps on getting them out of it, and they keep on preaching, and people keep on getting pricked in their hearts. If you looked up the word and the meaning of, the, of pricked in their hearts, it very simply, clearly says that only in this verse, verse number 37, the way it means, I looked this up, I went, oh my gosh, it's, and it, it is something that some of you know, but it says, besides being pierced, they were agitated violently. That's what your Strong's Concordance says. Agitated violently. That's powerful. That means that they need to do something about the something that was going on inside their heart. I can tell you, I couldn't take it anymore. When I called in the name of the Lord to save me, I couldn't take it anymore because the conviction of what the Holy Spirit, I didn't even know who he was, I didn't know what he was doing. I wanted him to go away, but he wouldn't go away. When I read the Bible, even though I was a lost man, I, I just was getting this reproof. I was getting God just smacking me and reminding me that you are a sinner and you're going to go to hell unless you call in the name of the Lord to save you. That's being pricked in their heart. Church, your Christmas conversation has to be a place with you having such a strong convictions, your why, that you bring it about to tell people the who is most important in all of this. The second part of verse number 37 tells me this. Christmas conversations can involve people who have questions. Well, I don't know if they have questions. You know, people oftentimes have questions about the convictions they feel, but since you dominate the conversation, they can never ask the question. That was pretty good. I'm just going to say amen. That was pretty good. I don't ever do that. Why did I do that there? Because it's on me. I've learned over the years that a lot of people, Milt, had a question and I shut them off. I'm terrible about that. Because that question may be this question. That question may be this question. Men and brethren, what shall we do? When someone asks you that question, <laughs> some of you that have been in a person's life around them asking that question, you know what I'm talking about, right, Randy? When someone says, well, what do I do? It's beautiful. Well, I don't know what you should do. You should probably just stay lost and go to hell. No. You see, this Christmas conversation is bubbling here. Something got started. You talked about something that had great conviction. The why is the conviction you have over Jesus Christ saving you in what it's about in Christmas. It's not about the virus. It's not about the mass. It's not about all of that. It's not about the chiefs. Oh, I know they're wonderful. It's not about that. It's not about all the presents and all that. You say, well, I know that. Then, duh, wake up. Yes, I sound like I'm losing it. My granddaughter will say, Grandpa, you get angry. Listen, I'm not angry. I'm broken by missing the questions that people have to ask, and I didn't let them ask them. Because a person with a Christmas conviction and a person with a Christmas conversation will say, wow, there's people in the room that have questions. The question is, men and brethren, what shall we do? What do I do? See, by the way, a lot of churches will teach the gospel, and they'll talk about the gospel, and they'll say, oh, this is the gospel, and then the people will walk out the room going, what do I do with the gospel? You come up front, you bow your knee, you come and grab me, you say, I want to get saved, and I'll find somebody to show you how to get saved. If you need to know what to do, we've got plenty of people who can show you what to do. I know a lot of people, they can tell you what to do. Right, Sean? Right, Melissa? Hey, what do I do? Well, you need to make Jesus Christ the Lord of your life, the Savior of your life, and stop playing around with religion. Okay, I'll do that. And you do it. Because somebody in a good Christmas conversation got to a point where someone was convicted and someone asked a question, and then the Christmas conversation goes to these last two pieces. They mu it must turn into something like this. It must involve people who will direct people to the name of Jesus. I was already starting on that. But look at what it says there in verse number 38. Then Peter said unto them, repent. Very important statement right there. It's beautiful. Repent. You're going one way, go another. You know the word. Repent. 
repent of your religion. Repent of, just, just repent. Say, I'm not going that way anymore. It says there then, because that repentance is tied together with salvation, but he says, and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Remember doctrinally what's being told here. Clearly, the baptism is the evidence of the repentance and the remission of calling on the name of the Lord to save them. That's what it's saying. And if you do a lot of studying and you want to know why they translated it the way they understand it, and they come through this, it, you, you, you can go through a ton of stuff. But the simple matter of it is, for the remission of sins, very simply in that statement, it's being said, hey, on account of your sins being remitted because you got saved and calling on the name of the Lord, why don't you go get baptized? Can you imagine the statement of all those Jews? Again, we mentioned it yesterday. Excuse me, last Sunday. Whew. 3,000 Jews saying, I repented of my Jewish way and I called on Jesus for the remission of my sins. I want to be baptized. Can you imagine that picture right there? For all the other Jews that wouldn't, but then some other Jews did because they got convicted. Because there's a lot of conviction going on in this conversation. You see, I hope is that the Acts 2 project takes such root that is a continuation of the Acts 1-8 vision. And that we're so purposed and so, in, uh, uh, so intentional and so focused on everyone around us that we're aware that there's spiritual conviction that there's questions out there and we need to be in a place where that conversation gives them answers because Christmas conversations need to involve people who testify and exhort with words about salvation it's something really cool here, this phrase. In the Bible, it never really struck me as strong as it did in my study these last few days. Verse 40 says this. And with many words did he testify and exhort. With many other words did he testify and exhort saying, save yourself from this untoward generation. Do not think that Peter's messaging and conversation were over because he kept on going, continuing daily with one accord in the temple, house to house, breaking of bread, gladness and singleness of heart. That's what they did as a church, and that's what the apostles continued to do. So much so that in Acts chapter number 6, they had to come up with a bunch of deacons to take over some of the, um, the office of doing the things they had to do so they could continue the preaching and teaching and prayer of the Word of God so more people could come to Jesus Christ. Boy, that would be a nice problem to have. So let's have it. Let's stop dreaming about it. Dreams are a bunch of baloney of man's concoction where they want God to meet some of their needs. You know what vision from God is? It's God's truth from his word declared to you that you go tell everybody else and have this vision of God saving people. That's the Bible. That's what the Bible says. If you go and preach it, he will save them. If you do nothing, he will do nothing. Simple. Simple. But sanctify the Lord God in your heart. And be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. Again, I use this verse often to, to have, just, just, just to encourage you, to exhort you with many words, as I would exhort a lost person, that I need to sanctify myself in my own heart as a witness as a person with conversations, as a person with convictions, or else 
those answers aren't coming out with any kind of power at all. They're going to come out with my power and not any Holy Spirit of God power. They're going to be squelched by my arrogance, by my pride, by my, I know the answer. Boy, that sounded terrible. Gosh. Verse 41 tells me that if I would just have the answers properly, that if I would continue in this place, if you would continue in this place of saying, hey, I like having a Christmas conversation off of the great convictions that I have. The why of the convictions is because of what he has done for me. The who of all of this conversation is Jesus Christ, the one doing it for all of me. The why and the who are very important. The where is in the temple and from house to house. The what is that we go. It's very, very simple. The how is with one accord. The how is with singleness of heart, gladness of heart. And the Lord, as it says in the last verse of chapter number 2, and the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved, just as he did up there, and the same day they were added unto them about 3,000 souls. These are not messages about me saying, okay, performance-based salvation. We just need to do all the points and the poems and everything will work out beautifully. I just need to go and get one of these little red books and, and just, just, just pass it out to somebody and hopefully they'll figure it out. No, how about if I just opened it up and said, hey, I'd love to talk to you about this picture. What does this picture mean to you? And listen to somebody tell you, what this picture means to them when they see this picture of someone call, carrying this big bag called sin. And then maybe I would show somebody that picture there and go, man, I, that person looks like they're going through awful pain. What do you think? You show that to a four-year-old, a five-year-old, a six-year-old, they're easily going to figure out that someone's in torment. Now you've got a conversation going. And then you turn the page and you say, Boy, there's a lot of words in there. What is it saying? Well, it's saying that God is just and righteousness, righteous, and he sent his son to be the propitiation of our sins, and that's why he hung him on the cross. Because the father needed a perfect sacrifice. And so I, I see where you got another picture there. And the question's, and the interaction and the conversation are so sweet. That's just one way. You see, conversations are ready for you and me all day long. I just need to stop and say, I would like to talk to you. Me? Do you have a few minutes? Yes. And if somebody doesn't have the time, my experience is they always say, hey, can we get together and visit some other time when it's convenient? But you can be rest assured if you stay on the streets long enough and you go up to a long, enough people long enough, you're going to have conversations like this. Who will your Christmas conversation be with this year? And who will it be about? Is it going to be about you again? about all the wonderful things that you've done? Or is it going to be about all the wonderful things that he has done? Oh, holy night. The name that's the strong and mighty tower, your name. Oh, come all ye unfaithful. What a song. You see, there's people that have conviction in their whole, by the Holy Spirit in their hearts. There's people that have questions over their convictions. They need someone to be able to give them an answer. And then they need someone to keep on telling them, keep on telling them, keep on telling them, and keep on warning them, today is the day of salvation. Would you bow your heads for a word of prayer as we prepare to go into the Lord's Supper, which is the same focus as we've had during our last few minutes in our message. Who will your Christmas conversation be with and who will it be about? Our Father in heaven, 
We call out to you. We cry unto you. We beseech you. Right now we're careful for nothing, but everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. We're letting our requests be made known unto you. We're coming in the name of Jesus as you taught us. Hitherto you've asked nothing in my name. Ask and receive that your joy may be full. So we come holding back nothing. We come in the name of Jesus Christ. And we just ask you to work in each one of our hearts. I pray for my brothers and sisters in the Lord, for my family in Jesus. I pray for Christmas conversations like they've never had and like we've all never had this particular year. I pray for our convictions, why we are like we are, to be stronger than ever, just like Peter's just like the apostles that we ought to be today. And I pray that we'll understand who you are and that the who we sit down across from is as important as any person that you ever made. And that God, as you use us, work in us both the will and to do of his good pleasure, your good pleasure, that God will see the fruit of that and you will add to the church as you promised you would. Now I pray as we come to the Lord's Supper that God, you will remind us, our Father, why you sent your son Jesus and that he is the who that we needed the only one that we ever 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 could see for the remission of our sins I pray that you will remind us and I pray as we examine our hearts that you will see vessels fit for your use the master in Jesus name Amen